Continuing our conversation, this intergenerational uh, conversation, dialogue between the generation of 76 and the generation of now, uh, particularly focusing on empowering women. What are the struggles then? What are the struggles now? How do we move forward? What has changed? What hasn't changed? What can we do about it? And uh, just before the break, we were listening to uh, Joy uh, Mulcuevo. She's uh, left us now, so we've got uh, space for uh, another person who's just joined us now. And um, I suppose this is a woman who understands working in uh, what was traditionally uh, a man's place, um, a retired brigadier general at the uh, SANDF, Mekefilwe uh, Matiba. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, during the struggle, you had equal opportunity to lose your life, equal opportunity to spill blood. But I guess moving into the more structured SNDF, there's a lot of challenges there in terms of the role of women, how far they can rise mm -hmm. and the places that they can take. Tell us about your journey uh, coming out of the struggle and into the SNDF. Into the SNDF. Thank you so much, mm. uh, Peter, for having me here. Thank you, and uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning, South Africa. Um, you know, I actually uh, just retired uh, the 31st of May <laughs> wow. this year. So uh, I, I just want to say that, uh, as obviously, the struggle began for us uh, in the 70s. I was the class of 76 at Morris Isaacson High School. Um, and uh, joining uh, the, 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 the MK specifically uh, uh, internally and uh, integrating into the Department of Defense, which uh, had to change in the sense of uh, the different forces that were coming together. Firstly, remember that we had the MK, we had the APLA, we had the TBVZ, we had also the SANDF, who at that time, by the way, were our enemies. So we had to basically come together. But in the coming together again, there was a struggle again still for women, by the way. Uh, and the very same uh, you know, uh, comrades that we'd have trained with but uh, when you are now sitting around the table, it was a question of you are a woman, we are men. And uh, who, who, who has fought at the sharp end? Who has not fought at the sharp end? So those were the struggles. And uh, we, there, there, there had to be a, a, a process of transformation, which uh, had to be able to say that uh, we have fought the struggle together, and therefore we all, have to be on the table together, and we all have to write the policies together. So the policies that uh, we came up with were the policies that we said we need to transform. Firstly, we have to transform the mindset, the patriarchy, patriarchy again, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, who is a soldier? Is it just a woman? Is it just a man that is a soldier? Can't a woman be a soldier also? Mm -hmm. Um, and again, it was a question, uh, Peter, of saying that, uh, can women become pilots? Uh, can women become uh, sailors? Can women fight in the forefront? And as this young, young, young woman who's just said now, who's uh, in the electrical engineering said that, uh, but it's about my knowledge. Yes, there are processes, basically, of training, but uh, if I am able to do what men are doing, why, can, why can't I do that? Mm. If I'm able to become a pilot, and it, it opened up, by the way, we've got women pilots uh, in the Defense Force, we've got women who are sailors in the Defense Force, by the way, and uh, we, of course, we've got different... Uh, uh, other areas where women can actually take part. So um, my, in, in, in being retired, actually, as a brigadier general for that matter, it was unheard of in the, in the past. Mm -hmm. We've got major generals in the Defence Force. The struggle still continues. Mm -hmm. There is still a need for lieutenant generals that those that are remaining are still basically fighting that, that fight. 
uh, in the defense force. Mm. Yes. Okay, um, and I'm not sure where to go because there's just so many things to touch on, so many things to deal with. But I think one of the things that uh, is just kind of cutting across all is women, uh, uh, violence against women and mm. children. Um, we're seeing a lot more on campuses. We're seeing demonstrations taking place. Um, let me let me go to the floor. Actually, um, I know we've got a number of uh, SRC presidents here. Nompendulo uh, Mkachwa, you were quite visible in the last kind of. Um, where are we? There we go. If you could stand up, let's get a microphone to you. Um, uh, in the hashtag Fismas Fall campaign, however. I do want you to speak to what's happening on campuses at the moment, because we're seeing an increase uh, in the incidence of violence and sexual assault against young women. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about what, what, why is this happening? What is uh, the struggles that women are facing um, in terms of A, reporting, dealing with it, and staying safe? I mean. Thank you very much for giving me <laughs> this question mm. that I was not expecting. Mm. Um, but I mean, I think it's a huge uh, concern and, and we're highly disappointed as women mm. in the movement. And I think everyone who's part of the movement should be disappointed in the level of patriarchy and misogyny in it. Because if you are preoccupying yourself as a, as a, as a man uh, a student leader, with Ukshogolozo Mumimfazi, who's equally playing a very important role in the particular movement that, which, is, which success will equally benefit you, then you don't understand the struggle and the mission at hand. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, first of all, as women, we're fighting, we're fighting three oppressions, right? We're fighting race, we're fighting class, and we're fighting gender. Noting that we are such a huge constituency in society in general, I mean, st uh, uh, stats say that women are in majority, it's very clear that in a movement you need masses. So you can't now provoke the very same masses that you need. In a struggle that, that excludes black students particularly, you can't exclude black women from the struggle. So it's very unstrategic and not tactful. I mean, let's, let's not even talk about the principle of it. Let's just talk about strategy and tactic. It does not make sense to be to be exclusionary along the lines of gender and generally inter intersection, um, intersectionally. I mean, we are at a time in society when we should be inclusive of a number of races, a number of genders, ages, class. There's a lot of issues that we need to take into consideration as we're moving forward in society. So it's not strategic. Mm. Let's leave the principle out of it. Mm. Um, let's just deal with this. it and, and the strategies. It's not strategic to exclude women in the manner in which we're being excluded in. And it makes you question whether or not your comrades are in fact conscientized. Mm. Because are we not reading the same ideologies? The question of saying, no, but uh, comrades, we'll deal with your issue of uh, gender at a later stage. The main priority right now is, uh, mm. is this thing. <laughs> Don't bring your issues of woman mm. here into yeah. the space. That's highly problematic. Mm. Mm. You know, I, I mean, when must we have our discussion? If Omama in 1976 were battling with the same mm. issue where they were being told, no, wait, we're dealing with the issue of race. Mm. In 2016, we're dealing with an economic issue because we realize how education plays a vital role in the transformation and the development of this economy. And we're still being told in the class struggle that, no, wait, your woman issues must, must, must fall back. So I don't know at what time, at what point will we be free? What if you, we keep on suspending various segments of the revolution. Let me ask you this. What is, what it, why do you think young men think they can behave the way that they do? Male privilege. Male, male privilege. privilege. Okay. It's a socialization that is very historic in society. And it takes a lot of hard work to undo that particular uh, uh, socialization mm. that is rooted within our communities, rooted within... within uh, um, our families, mm. it takes a lot of work to undo that. And I mean, by the time that you're teaching a man about what patriarchy means and what male privilege is, they're in, they're in varsity and you're, you're 19. That's very late. Mm. So, I mean, such teachings, I think, 
I've heard a lot of people speak about women empowerment from an early age, um, and and in 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 in, in the less developed uh, communities of our of our of our country, I think it's equally important to then conscientize young men, not to see their um, woman uh, uh, counterpart as, as as inferior, but to see them as a progressive force yeah. in the particular movement that we're in. And the only thing that, I mean, you're talking about institutions of high learning and the issue of sexual harassment on them. First of all, I mean, I've, you've seen a number of these protests that, that have taken place in our institutions, and it's unfortunate that we've had to take the particular posture that we've taken, and I think I, I, I've, I've been pondering with the idea of calling it the armed struggle of, of, the, of the gender struggle, where women are saying then one patriarch, ten shambox, because we feel that the legal systems of our universities are not assisting us. Mm. We feel that the legal system of the country is not assisting us. You know, people telling you how to prove that you've been sexually harassed. Mm. <laughs> how? Yeah. You know, um, so so there's a long okay. way for us to go, and right. one so patriarch tension. It needs to go up higher up the agenda. All right, just some comments. Maybe let's start with you, Akone, and the minister. And, and it's quite sad, Peter, that um, we've found ourselves in institutions having to discuss policies around sexual harassment, around rape, whilst we're having the struggle of free education, because men think that they have the right to the female body. And it's, it's shameful on our man society that from a society where people, male and female, fought together, the apartheid system, that now as young female we are being exploited by the very same comrades that um, people are speaking of here as well. Because even as females, whilst we get into these leadership roles, you're automatically set up for failure because you need to continuously prove yourself as to why you're such a good leader, whilst a man is put to be SRC president, and when he's failing, he's said to be, he's finding his feet. Whilst as a woman, I need to continuously prove myself that I'm good enough. And that's the problem with our society. Okay, so help me understand. 51% of this country is female. You could outvote us every single time. Why aren't we seeing more women taking charge and managing the situation? I think yeah. there's, a, there's a number of uh, issues that we need to address, Peter, because over and above the fact that the men don't enable mm. us, we also don't take our space because we always think I need to be 130% mm. before I can take my space. Yet men, as she was, the young woman was saying, that they can know 70% of what you know, but they have the confidence. And the challenge is us mothers, is how we bring out bring up our boys instead of our girls. We teach our boys at a very early age to be confident, to believe they can. Mm. And we think as a girl, you need to work twice as hard before you can. Mm. And this is where the, the, the failure actually starts. Mm. It starts with us to make sure that we teach our girls at an early age to have the confidence that they can because they do. Mm. And that's where the journey should start. Mm. Minister, you want to add to that? Thanks very much. I think it's very important the point which has been raised, and the point raised by Unom Pindulo of uh, socialization, mm. very, very key. But it also talks to the development of a child, because it's how, as we conceive the children, and how do we build them and prepare them to be part of society. So the issue of making sure that we move away from the space of saying um, he's a boy, he can't play with a doll. She's a girl, she can't play with a car. It starts, it's the indoctrination, it's how we socialize our children, which becomes important because it, because it reflects the future. You know, sometimes I say, our age, we've got to greater extent accept that um, Generations to come will be the ones which will create an equal society in South Africa. Because, but it's our responsibility to, to say the young generations must be properly socialized, both psychologically and behavioral. Because if we're unable to do that, we'll continue to have this skewed environment. 
because the boy child is taught that a girl is lesser, including a wo not even a girl, a woman. That is why we see a boy child rising even against the mother, because he believes he's much, much more stronger and much more smarter than you. So it's how you are socialized, which becomes very important. So I think for me, one of my responsibility, which sometimes some people think it's controversial, I always say the issue of raising, whilst we empower the girl child, we can't leave the boy child. Because if we're going to leave the boy child, we're going to create a monster. Mm. So how we bring the two kids, it's very key. Without saying the girl child is less important. The empowerment of the girl child is very important. The boy child and the girl child must be competent, must be able to be assertive and accept. If a boy child, a girl child performs better, must accept. The girl child is not performing better because it's a girl. It's a human being. We are all human beings. Okay. Therefore, on the basis of our ability, we are able to perform differently without looking at gender. So I'm going to, yeah, you can applaud if you want. <laughs> so I'm going to throw this out now. Um, and I don't know if anyone can pick this up. What role does culture have to play in this whole equation? Um, we talk about patriarchy. There's this example of the virginity testing that's taking place in KwaZulu-Natal. And I was quite disheartened personally to see women leading the opposition to the Gender Equality Court's decision uh, at a press conference saying, no, this is what we want. We want this virginity testing. And I, I don't know, um, our culture has been set up in a certain way. As a man, I, I do enjoy privilege as it's been set up. How do we change this? Do, does, that, does that mean that we can have both? We can have culture and this new society? Or do we have to choose between one or the two? Let me ask the ladies on this desk here, this table here, if we can get a microphone to you. In fact, I'm going to start with you, DG. I know that you weren't expecting me to come to you. <laughs> DG Jenny Schreiner, I know that you've written a lot of things on um, gender and, uh, and I just wonder, and I'm going to ask another lady here, can we have both? Can we have culture and can we have the disappearance of patriarchy? Thank you, and um, you did catch me by... Yes, by. I know. <laughs> I, I was here to listen and to, to enjoy the, the intergenerational yeah. discussion. No society can be without culture. Mm. But culture changes. Culture is not something that's static. Culture is something that we choose to design. Okay, just put your mic close to your mouth. Sorry? Yeah. Culture, it, all, all societies have got culture. It's not something that is static. It's for us to be able to say, what is the culture that will enable us to build the South Africa of the Constitution? Um, we, we have a wonderful Constitution that is non-sexist, it's non-racial, it wants a, a prosperous society for all of us with no, in, no in, uh, inequality. And for me, we need to be engaging with how do we change culture. Um, we all uh, have got very diverse cultures, Lots of similarities, and patriarchy is one of them. But for us as a generation, we challenged our own parents mm. around our own culture. Um, certainly the way that I've brought up my children, although the values of integrity, equality, fairness, justice, democracy have been constant mm. through the generations of my family, our culture is changing. And we are looking at taking on ideas from other cultures, cross-cultural mm. fertilization, and I think for me it's that that we need to mm. be looking at. If we want men and women to be able to be equal, we can't hold on to cultural values that breed inequality. And it, okay. it needs self-reflection, and it needs engagement. Okay, all right. Look at you, so Matabese, where are you? Okay. Um, you can, you've written something here. You can share your thoughts with us on that. Good morning. My name is Lukanyiso Matebese, Deputy President of the UWCSRC. Um, I'm proud to see my president sitting up there. Um, so we've got a, male, a female president, female deputy yes. president. <laughs> hey, <Amandla. laughs> 
<laughs> and you know, as we were having conversations, I was getting brainwaves. You know, when you want to say this and you want to yeah. say that, but I yeah. think I'll stick to one thing um, that I wrote there. But what I wanted to speak about, as we were having conversations with the ladies yesterday, we were listening to the older generation speak to us about this fees must fall. And I'll, I'll, I'll tap into why I think this is very important. How the, the older generation highlighted yesterday how fees must fall, students stop burning these buildings. You can see how, how out of touch they are with these female leaders. Mm -hmm. Because if we were in touch, you would know that it was not us. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? And it's very important that you become in touch with us because most um, SRC leaders are females, especially this year. And what they want is for us to not succeed. They want for us to fail. And when society sees that these leaders are burning things and they're not thinking and they're not making the right decisions, that's where mm. they are able to cause cracks within us. Mm. And I think for the older generation, it's very important that you speak to us. It's very important that we, when we are in leadership, that you strengthen us, that you make sure that we succeed mm. at all times. Who's sabotaging you, know? you? Who are the people burning No, us no, we won't, we can't, <laughs> we can't do that. <laughs> It's, it's males. Okay. It's, it's All right. people like you. <laughs> no. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> okay. All right. So how do we... You, I think you spoke about the uh, women pulling each other down. Because I've seen it myself, actually, that sometimes the venom that a woman unleashes on another woman, I don't see in men. With men... We fight and it's done and we go and have a drink. With men, you carry grudges for a long time. And <laughs> Tell me a little bit about how do we change that? How do we get women to empower each other um, and strengthen each other? I think, Peter, the key is to know first that we're different, mm. that we come, we all bring to the table different energy, we bring different skills, and it's okay. And the other big thing that we need to acknowledge is that we need to begin to look for people that are different mm. from us. Because in many instances, I want to look for you because you're either my friend, mm. or we come from the same movement, mm. or we come from the same generation. And for me, the exciting opportunity that we have of this intergenerational engagement is that we can then begin to share experiences but be able to teach each other different things because there's lots of things that I continue to learn from my, learn my young colleagues, from my managers that are younger than me because there's certain things that I don't have but there's other things that I bring to the table and for me it's exciting to hear the young people saying when you know we're out there, we're in the cold, because it is always very cold mm. at the top. It's very cold, particularly for women at the top. Mm. And it's our responsibility as the older generation to make sure that we actually reach out to you and say, what is it that we can do to support you? How can we help you? How can we strengthen you as parents first, okay. but over and above that, as leaders that need to strengthen you. Okay. Nomsa uh, Sindan. Where is Nomsa? Okay, Nomsa. Uh, can we get another one? There's another one coming through to you. Okay. Hello. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. I was known as Nom Sankosi at Morris Isaacson. I'm one of the 76. 76. <clears throat> uh, what I'm doing now, I'm out of uh, the 76 uh, struggle. I am making an awareness, a noise induced hearing loss. Our children are gradually growing deaf because of the earphones. 
they are not aware how many decibels they have in their ears. They, they, their earphones consume 105 decibels and they're supposed to listen to 75 down. And what I've picked up, I'm an occupational health mm -hmm. advisor as well. I have my own company, I go around schools, I'm making this awareness. And it pains me mm -hmm. to see a 16 year old who's deaf already, who's using hearing aids, which are supposed to be used by me at 58. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is there's a lot of preventable deafness that's taking place. Yes. What happens, I'll, I'll briefly explain yes. what happens in your ear. We know that the ear is, is divided into three parts. It's the outer ear, the, the inner ear, mm. the middle ear, and the inner mm. ear. In the inner ear, there are hair cells, which are finger-like projections. Mm. So when you put your earphones, those finger-like projections, they bend to release the auditory nerve. The auditory nerve is the one that interprets sound. Right. And these hair cells are gradually growing deaf. Okay. They are gradually getting destroyed. And when they are completely destroyed, you are deaf for life. Okay. So our children are not aware of such dangers okay. they are exposed to. All right. I think that's a very powerful point, oh, too. Thank you. So, yeah, I know you're listening to Casper in your vest. And <laughs> AKA, just turn the volume down a little bit, please, please, please. Very important. Uh, Dineo Mukone. Thank you very much. Dineo Mukone, where are you? Okay, we'll get a microphone to you. Uh, is there someone who's in high school right now? Yes. All right, stand up, one of you. Let's see who the first one, because we're going to get a microphone to you. There we go. Can we get a microphone there? <laughs> All right, Dineo? Good morning, everyone. My name is Dino Mukoni, Academic Director from Ekuruleni East Tibet College. It is a privilege to be here, and I am inspired by Umis Mukwebe, who is also from A Tibet College. I, one thing I realized here is that we are not recognized. And it is by shame, but we have uh, someone, an electrical woman from A Tibet College. Let's uh, acknowledge Tibet because we are women from Tibet College. Okay, leaders, what I wanted to say here is that we got, uh, we got a chance to be here as women. Let's go back to our institutions and start activizing these programs. We have women who come from different uh, disadvantaged background and different cultures who cannot voice out their uh, feelings. So as leaders, we are chosen and let's give back to our institutions. Thank you. Okay, very good points. Uh, can we get the microphone to the uh, future leaders uh, that are sitting at that table there. If I could just get one of them to speak. A, share your thoughts, and then also B, are you getting enough guidance at school about the important decisions that you're gonna have to be making about the future? What are your thoughts? Your name and the school that you go to. Okay, Ma good morning everyone. My name is Mrs. Suem Kiza from the Lady High School. I'm doing commercial studies. Another mic. Uh, just put it close to your mouth. It's the one which is yeah. not working. I'm doing commercial studies there we grade go. 10. Uh, I don't think we're getting enough guidance. Okay, we need another microphone to come to you. Hey, Batong. <laughs> there we go. Uh, I don't think we're getting enough guidance as, as to what we should do to make our careers like mm. achieve our dreams. Yeah. Um, I know this, there's this campaign that, that's giving pursuits to virgin girls. What about the ones that, has, that have been raped, but they do not have the finances to finance their future? Mm. What about the boy virgins? Mm. We should not focus only on girls. We should be equal okay. because we're fighting gender inequality. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> That's definitely uh, a future SRC president there. 
All right, we're running out of time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you, I'll start with you, Ame, if you could just, your final thoughts in about 30 seconds each, incorporate some of the things that you've heard, but just your final thoughts that you'd like to leave with us. Uh, let's start with you. All right. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, I, I just want to say, especially to the young people, and I just want to share quickly that uh, on the 3rd of June, we invited the Defence Force to come to Morris Isaacson High School. And I was sharing with the minister to say to her that, for me, it was so convincing when I look at, especially young girls who were wide open eyes when they heard that, wow, can I actually get into becoming a pilot? Can I train as an engineer? Can I train as a sailor? And, I, I, and I'm saying that then now the alumni of Morris Isaacson has taken a stance to say that it is our responsibility to come down to where we also uh, drank, if I could say, mm -hmm. and, and be able to assist in becoming the parents, as, as parents, but also as educators, so that the teachers, the principals, can do what they are supposed to do, which is education. Okay. We have already discussed the issue of the drugs also, and norms are also with the, you know, the, the hearing aids thing. It's, it's about us taking the responsibility okay. and going down to the ground and doing what we are supposed to Fantastic. do. Fantastic. 30 seconds. I got Thank you. I think for us as young students, we want to say to the 1976 um, generation, rally behind us as South African youth for the call for free quality education for the poor. And we want you to voice with us that we want free education in our lifetime. And you've achieved your own struggles with regards to access, but ensure that that young female who still needs to go to higher education is able to afford that. And that's what we need to refocus our energies as the women of South Africa. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Akona Landu. Totsi Memela. I think the issue of the Tivets has been raised a great deal, and it's one thing that we're not doing enough as a country to make sure that we don't only create job seekers, but we actually create people that can create jobs. And in many instances, the skills that we need as a country are not necessarily only for academia, but they are also for us to be able to build this country and make sure that we can move from good to great. Fantastic. And Minister, your final thoughts? Thank you very much, Peter. Just to pick up on the last point of the Tivet uh, uh, situation, just to indicate that it's one area where government has acknowledged there has been less attention given to that. Hence, the Deputy President of the country, through the Human Resource Development Council, is one of the dedicated areas which he's responsible for in really trying to make sure TVET meets their objectives, not just becomes a place of keeping mm. people busy. I thought it's important to mention that. I must also say we need to work together with the young people. The issue of culture, which is static, which is primitive, okay. it's all of us here who needs to come back and fight that. You as the young people, we can fight, but if yourselves as young people are unable to voice articulate and object to some of the things which are happening, they will continue happening because they affect you directly. So I just want to appeal. Part of our responsibility coming out of here, the issue of Ukutwala, we need to work together in a campaign. Okay. The issue of uh, virginity testing, let's work together in saying no to virginity testing because there are better methods, but also you need to get empowered as young people okay. without using particular aspects. Lastly, I want to say to all of you, this year we are celebrating the 60th anniversary, the achievement of our mothers, mm. your grandmothers. Let's rally behind that and make sure what they fought for, it's not lost. Because okay. what we are achieving today, it's in the Women's Charter drafted by those women. And thank I want to thank you very much indeed, Minister and our panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you at home for being part of this conversation. Make Youth Month every month and Youth Day every day. And uh, let's make a difference. Take care, everybody. See you next time. Bye-bye.